Good morning, product people. Hi. How are you? I'm super excited to talk to you today. Um, I'm still looking at this. This is a different slide. Huh? I'm uh, super excited to come talk to you today about uh, one of my favorite topics. It's around uh, Gen AI. And what I want to share with you in the next 20, 25 minutes is basically how at Booking we're thinking about this and share a little bit about the product that we launched a little while ago and lessons. And hopefully those are some of the information that I share with you, you can take back home today and actually act and uh, incorporate into your product plans. Um, do you guys like the title of the session? Uh, actually, I didn't write it. That was ChatGPT when I gave it the contents and I asked for a catchy title. That's what it came out with. So uh, it kind of stuck. Um, so before I get into the session, just want to share a little bit more about me. Um, you can tell by my accent, I'm probably not from around here. I was born in the US, but I spent most of my childhood in, in Europe. I've lived in six countries, uh, worked my way back to North America, uh, doing my education in Canada, and then my, most of my professional life in, in the US. Um, I live in Netherlands now. I've been in Europe for four years and, and loving it. Um, prior to joining Booking, which I did about 14 months ago, I worked 15 years at Microsoft, and that's where I transitioned from being a product developer to focusing on product around 20 years ago. I've dedicated my life to using technology to solving problems for our customers. Um, I've gone through a lot of, uh, in, in my years, I've had the luck or I guess uh, to be part of many, many disruptions. When I first started coding, I actually, we were taking character-based systems and moving them over to graphical user interfaces. Um, when I started at Microsoft, we started moving apps over to the internet. Um, I was very first in working on mobile search, mobile payments, as the mobile revolution came around. This was a few years before the iPhone even. And then probably the most thing that I'm most excited about and lucky to have in my, in my career is disruption that we're going through with generative AI. I joined Booking because I wanted to help using technology to make, um, make, the, make it easier for everyone to experience the world. Um, it's super exciting. Um, looking at booking with some of the numbers, we have actually a fairly large scale. Um, I think we're the largest OTA in the world right now. Started out of uh, Amsterdam in 1996. So we're one of those mature e-commerce companies. Um, the thing with scale, it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, while I'm going to be talking to you, we're probably going to book anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 trips for our travelers, which is super exciting because most people are right now are thinking about what they're going to do this summer, dreaming and planning, and then executing on, on booking on that. Um, with large scale also comes large responsibility as a PM. Uh, what that means is every time you make a slight change to your product, you can easily positively impact the end users and your business or negatively impact your, your business and your end users. So, We've kind of been doing A-B testing on every little thing that we've done for, for as long as Booking's been around. Now let's start thinking about Gen AI. So this was about, what, 13, 14 months ago when I'm sure you've all seen ChatGPT launch back in November 2022. And um, if you were like me, you were in, in awe with what the technology brought together. So we quickly, this was very, uh, very early in my, in my Booking career. I think it was day 10 um, while I was there. Uh, thinking about what does this mean to us? What does this disruption feel like? I talked to some of my friends back in the US that I worked for a very long time and they also shared the same excitement as I have. So I thought there was something there. We need to do something about it. So we looked at three main buckets. One is kind of like our product, traveler and partner facing. We're a two-sided marketplace, so we serve both our partners and our travelers. We thought about demand generation. Not sure if you've seen, if you go on to Google, you've probably seen an ad by Booking uh, we rely very heavily on demand generation um, for, our, for our business. And we were worried that if the demand generation business, like the likes of Google or other search engines, gets disrupted, we need to figure out what's going to happen and how we actually play into that ecosystem. And then lastly, we thought about internal productivity, um, especially for, for developers, for engineers. I've, I've never in my career ever seen engineers just sitting around with nothing to do. Uh, so the idea of making engineers 10 to 15% more productive is, is super exciting for us to build, build the products we really want to build much faster than we are capable of doing that today. Um, then we looked at what is it actually that we need to address 
And while all of those things are super important, uh, data and infrastructure, uh, legal risk, ethical AI, talent and people, today's session, I just want to really focus on something very specific, which is the product opportunity. So with many disruptions in the past, um, it's super important to really understand where things are going to. And I believe that the art of possible is going to change, just like it changed in all the other disruptions that I've gone through in my career. So it's super important for product, product people, for designers, user research, and so on, to kind of get on the same page and really understand and try to not predict the future, because that's super hard, but to really see where things are going to be going. Um, before I get into the examples, I just want to ground everybody on what Gen AI uh, is. This is an example I think you can go and probably tell your parents about. Uh, this is something that one of our product, uh, product uh, person and designers came up with in order for us to tell the story internally uh, when it first came out, just to make sure it makes sense for people. So the example here is, let's say, a chef with the best recipe. And I'll use the analogy. So if, if you want to become a chef, uh, you most likely will go to some sort of culinary school. You'll start learning about some very basic recipes. Then you'll get a little bit more advanced recipes. You will create the dishes. Uh, based on those recipes, you'll get feedback. You'll start understanding. You'll start fine tuning. So basically, as time grows and you become an expert, you will create your own recipes in a way that no one's ever done that before. Now imagine with this Gen AI uh, right now, what we can do is take every recipe that has ever been recorded in human history um, and feed it in there. Uh, imagine every cooking show ever recorded, every cooking book, every blog, vlog, whatever have you, you give it to this special brain. It's gonna be very much like the chef that I talked about that goes to culinary school. It will start learning, analyzing, look at the outcome, and then over time, it will actually start creating its own recipes, something unique, um, more at a scale, that, at more than any other chef in the world could ever do. The magic will then start learning the, the patterns and will start creating these uh, recipes. The interesting thing that uh, it will also start doing, if you are not careful, is it will start even creating uh, ingredients that don't exist. And some people call that hallucination. I just call it like interesting content creation. But it's really up to you to figure out when, when, when there's an answer that is uh, hallucinated or incorrect to ground it and make sure that the, the content that it's creating is, is correct. There was a, in a travel scenario, I'm not sure if uh, others seen it, Air Canada was just sued last week and lost where a chatbot was talking to a traveler and the traveler was asking for a refund. And they shouldn't have got a refund because based on Air Canada's website, it uh, told them exactly um, what the policies were and refund wasn't due. But the chatbot uh, looks like it hallucinated the answer and offered the refund to this traveler. Um, then they took him to court and the court said that the chatbot speaks of speaks for you, so um, super important to, to make sure that content's grounded. Uh, I kind of touched this already. So what does this mean to you? How do you approach it? And we're all not gonna go home and start building a chef type of software, although it, I think it would be kind of fun. Um, I've seen a, a video a couple of weeks ago by, by Hendrik Nieberg, who referred to this as kind of like Einstein in your basement. I really like this analogy. So imagine chef is like one kind of Einstein, and this Einstein knows all of the knowledge that has ever been recorded in, in human history. Um, oh, I get my, my thing scrolled here. <laughs> um, but imagine for you, what, what can these Einsteins be? So imagine that you can have, uh, let's say, architects, doctors, lawyers, designers. And then for our case in booking, it would be like, imagine if you can get the best travel agent that, that ever lived, that could scale to millions and millions and help our customers. So not just the travel agent, but let's say even a concierge, the concierge that would know all the ins and outs for where you want to travel, that could share that information with you at, at built into your app, something that you, you cannot do today. Um, so what's also very interesting, like I mentioned, a, what we've learned is that imagination is great, start figuring out what, what's possible, 
but then start playing around with doing prompt engineering because that's really where you start teaching this Einstein of what is that information that you want to convey to your customer? What is allowed? What isn't allowed? What is on brand? What are the things that you absolutely do not want it to answer? Because uh, it could be very, very chatty and it would love to answer all kinds of things, even give away all the secrets. Uh, early on, there was an example where somebody launched uh, a chatbot type of feature uh, based on OpenAI, and if you went and asked it for all the secret prompts, actually it told you. So imagine it would share all your secret code. Um, I want to also spend a, a little bit of time looking back in the past. I know I've, uh, I've already mentioned a little bit about uh, the evolution, software evolution, but it's interesting to look at history. Uh, about 50 years ago, uh, Bill Gates and, and Paul Allen had this dream of having a computer on every desk. And at that time, it seemed preposterous. Even experts from IBM or, or Hewlett Packard at that time, which were the, the leading edge software companies, thought that maybe we can have thousands, but we'll never have a computer on every desk. Little did we know that 50 years later, I bet most of you have uh, what at that time would be thought of as a supercomputer in your back pocket, always connected. And another interesting one to me was Mark Andreessen, that's, that's his photo, in around 2011, talked about software eating the world. And at that time, many people didn't really understand what that meant, but what his context was, he believes that all the products and services in the future will be powered by software, will be made much better by software. And to me, a, a great example would be a, a vehicle. I just bought an electric mini just a little while ago. And the re one of the reasons I bought it is because the app that comes with it. Um, I'm able to remotely control the vehicle. Um, I can actually, my favorite feature is preheating it because it's very cold in Amsterdam in the, in the winter. And I love to go to the gym wearing my shorts early in the morning. So that's a feature that I guess maybe 15 years ago people wouldn't have thought of but it's something that people expect and maybe not even buy a vehicle without that. And I feel the same with Gen AI. So Gen AI is, although there's quite a lot of hype and we really haven't seen very much consumer adoption yet, other than let's say ChatGPT or, or Gemini Bard or perhaps Microsoft's Copilot. But I really, I believe that it's fundamentally gonna transform the way we do things, the way we look at the world, uh, it'll revolutionize uh, creativity, help you automate tasks uh, with personalized content generation and help you with decision making as well. All right, so what does this mean to product managers? How should you approach it? Um, another one of my favorite quotes from my time in Canada, who knows who this person is? A few of you, uh, it's the great one, Wayne Gretzky. Actually, I didn't realize the name was on there. He had this quote that I, I use, uh, I use with my, my product managers or the team quite a lot, especially in, in times like this. And I think it stands the tall time. A good hockey player plays where the puck is, and a great hockey player plays where the puck's going to be. If there's anything that you should remember from today, I think that's one of the, one of the better quotes, is think about what will happen in 18 months, in 24 months, in 36 months. What will happen to what your customers will be expecting? Just like I mentioned, I will not buy a car that doesn't have a remote app. Uh, people not be looking to use your product the same way that they use it today. So the idea is, while it's super hard to predict the future, um, I'll, I'll share some things that, that we did in order for us to make sure that we're moving just as fast as possible. And the thing, do you guys, how many of you have uh, some sort of a customer journey? Great, I think it seems like most of you. Um, probably been around for a while if you're a mature company, Right? You probably know exactly what your customers are doing. One of the things that I urge in our team is to really go back and understand, is the customer journey something that we believe our customers are doing with respect to our business? Or is the customer journey really reflect the unmet needs of our customers that can potentially be met now with this new technology? And I believe the case is more like the later. As great I think it is right now to use our apps to uh, buy and manage your travel, there's so much more we can do. Just imagine back if, the, if we had the Einstein version of the travel agent, all the things some of you may be old enough to have actually used a travel agent before, um, they could really give you that tailored, customized experience 
which is really not available yet today, especially in a single app. So we went and did that. Um, we thought about what are the what is this disruption? What is it that it could superpower? And really understanding customer intent. Now for us, it's I think it's a little bit harder. I spent uh, many years prior to booking, and I thought I understood how to do uh, understand customer intent. Um, I worked in Microsoft Advertising Group. I, I started up uh, well, one of the groups on understanding really user intent. And and for us, it's it's a little bit more difficult because you take on different personas every time you travel. Just an example, maybe some of you flew here or some of you fly to, let's say, Manchester for, to your head office and you stay at some budget inn. Um, if that's all the travel you do and we look at try to create that persona, we think you like to go to Manchester and you like to stay at this budget inn. So now when you come and you try to plan an anniversary trip, maybe it's your 10th or 15th anniversary trip, it wouldn't work really well if we try to personalize you based on the knowledge we have. So for us, thinking, oh, how can we get a better intent that we can get today um, could be super powerful. And then lastly, the thing that I mentioned about hallucination or creating content, um, imagine if we know what you're looking for, and right now we have millions of property descriptions, which are all the same, have been fine-tuned for conversion, customer lifetime value, all of those things. But imagine if we know that you like pools or a great breakfast or a great gym. Uh, we could change that as one-to-one -one personalization based on what you tell us much easier than we could have ever done that before. A um, little bit of uh, a recap. This was actually uh, very interesting for us when we thought about our lifetime, uh, sorry, our, our, our customer journey and our understanding of trip intent. Really, trip intent isn't just that you want to go look for a specific hotel. That's just part of it. Trip intent would be something like cheap places to go for a week, the summer that is beachy with a direct flight. Um, probably most of you could relate to something like that. Um, if you want to go and book that travel, plan a travel today, it's, it's super hard. You probably do it in multiple places. Maybe you get your inspiration on Instagram, then you start researching on a search engine like Google, and then when you kind of have some information that you want to double uh, drill into or get some specifics, you go to an OTA like Booking or another one. So it's clearly that we have an opportunity for unmet needs that nobody is serving our customers yet. The second part is around understanding user context. And I mentioned, I, I mentioned a little bit about this. If all we know is a little bit about you, then the way we used to do personalization probably doesn't make sense. Imagine if we can ask you this information in a much easier way that you would share with us how we can personalize that. And it's interesting, I'm not sure if you guys seen the OpenAI uh, launched a couple of things last week. One was memory, um, which they'll be sharing in plain English all the things that you ever shared with them that they use as input, and also the things that they kind of came up with uh, based on your interactions. So this is another opportunity for us to, to look at. So I'm gonna share a little bit of a video. I think it's about a minute. This is something that we launched last June. We first launched in the US. We've actually launched it in, uh, in the UK as well uh, last December and it's fully ramped. So maybe during break or later, uh, you can download the app and, and try it out and give me some feedback. Could you guys see yourself using a tool like that in your next planning event? All right. Thank you. Well, give it a try.
Um, I want to introduce another topic, which I've been working through with my team just to see if I'm a little crazy or not. But I think there's going to be a paradigm shift in how we design apps. So if you look at like the example that, that I just showed you there, that's a combination of like a chatbot, natural, natural language user interface, and some other traditional pieces as, as well, like the carousel with the recommendations. So my theory is that today, we've been teaching our users how to use our system based on how they use other systems like ours. And we've been fine-tuning uh, with A-B tests on how we measure success and how we iterate on that. Let me give you an example. Um, today, if you go to an OTA, you, you give us your destination and a couple of dates. We taught you to do that. You, as soon as you show up, you just know how to do that. 30 years ago, you probably wouldn't guess why that's the way it is. Um, but all the other systems teach you that. So then you input the value, and most, even if you've never come to our site, you expect to see a search result, which then you can start manipulating. So this is kind of like learned behavior, right? This wasn't out there before when computing started. And, we, and then we start getting better at it by moving around some of the filters. We create some more filters. If we're personalized, if we remember used a filter before, we go do that. So that's kind of today's world. Um, but imagine like the video that I showed you and then tomorrow's world where the user doesn't have to learn this new paradigm or the paradigm that we fit in today. The user could just speak in their own natural language. So then the paradigm flip is that instead of us teaching our users how to best use our system, uh, which gives us the highest conversion, uh, customer lifetime value and all that and make our customers happy, uh, we need to build a system that understands what the users actually want to do and then complete the task that way. Does, does that resonate with some people, or is that crazy? Crazy? <laughs> resonate. All right. Um, so when we, when we did this, we came up with some, uh, some principles. Five's quite a lot. I wish we would have had three, but we needed to have five. And um, for us, we thought if we nail these things as we go through this transition, the user should feel magical, just like the video I showed you. It would feel pretty magical in order to use software like that. Um, the one thing that I do want to call out that I worry the most about, and it's really retaining or increasing, gaining trust with our users as we take them on this journey from our current user experiences to what I view as the, as the user experience of the future. Whether that future is 10, 12, 18 months from now, um, I believe that's coming. So trust to me is, is, is super key. And let me give you an example. I was just uh, looking for a new pair of sunglasses last week. I'm going on a trip and I want to have a cool pair. And uh, I think I clicked on an ad in one of the social networks and I started to get bombarded with a bunch of different sunglasses. It feels like everywhere I go. Some people think that's creepy. I actually don't mind it all that much. It could be annoying once I already bought my pair of sunglasses. The point I'm trying to make is Imagine with the personalization ability and content generation of today's tech that's using there, um, how creep it feel. Imagine if we take this and supercharge all those capabilities in the future. You could quickly come up with a system that users will just reject because it's just too, too freaky for them. Uh, so that's my, my, my personal opinion. So make sure you, you uh, keep and earn more trust as you build this out. So our learnings have been... Um, Revisit the unmet needs. Maybe you have some, maybe you don't. I think if you really go back to basics and understand what your users are trying to accomplish, uh, you could probably come up with some. If it's possible, validate the extended scope. Um, if you put up a natural language uh, interface, it's very easy. I personally read thousands of anonymized ones. People are wanting to do things with us tomorrow that we never gave them a chance to do because we've only asked you to put in uh, destination and dates. Now they're telling us all kinds of information. Uh, this was something, the second point, we learned kind of uh, halfway through. We're a mature business, a high-scale business. We've got our own metrics. When you introduce something new um, and you really don't know how to measure it or how to extrapolate it to the overall measurements that the company worries about, um, it may seem like what you're doing with the business results are lagging. What we really need to do is really understand how do you actually measure a funnel that's conversational versus the normal e-commerce funnel that people are used to. 
And like I mentioned, earn trust with users. Um, so the takeaway for you, this is your homework, three bullets, not five. Uh, figure out who's your Einstein and figure out what they can do for your customer. Uh, next thing is build as much as you can, as fast as you can. Um, we had ran a hackathon back, back last February in order for us to try to figure out what are all the different options, what are the possibilities. And this product that we launched was actually based on the hackathon only 10 weeks later. The last point is we're all just learning, embrace this. Even when you look at things like OpenAI's last week's Sora release, you're just in awe of what some others are doing. But the reality is most of us are just still learning and there's so much to learn. And the more you do, the more you will learn in order to make your product better. I'll leave you with a, a, a disruption of another kind. And this happened probably a little bit over 100 years ago. But there's so many similarities of what happened there to what's happening with generative AI or the other tech revolutions that we've had. This is one of my other favorite quotes about uh, overestimating the effect of technology today. The reality is nothing's really changed as of today, even though it's been out for a year. And then we underestimate the effect in the long run. And this image is actually very interesting because if you do a little bit of research on this, at the time when cars were starting to enter the roads, the biggest concern for everybody was that the horses are getting scoop, uh, spooked by the cars. They weren't worried about other things. So there was actually, you can, you can uh, Google this now, somebody had a patent, somebody actually built a car with a wooden horse in the front because they thought that if we do that, all the problems are solved and then horses and cars will be sharing the road. Little did they think at that time is, well, these cars are going to get much faster, right? They're going to start delivering a lot more people. We'll have buses. We'll have trucks. Uh, there'll be accidents. We'll probably need lights at intersections. Very similar to how Gen AI is being treated right now. I was a little bit spooked last summer when Italy actually banned generative AI. I don't know if you guys remember that for a few weeks. But we were really scared of what's happening. How do we build a global product? Do we need to build in all these features in order to turn some things off? or behave in a different way. So with that, I think um, the call to action for you guys is to kind of go back, go back to your work, uh, listen about some of the things. Hopefully, I uh, provoked some things for you to go take back and uh, incorporate in your product. Thank you.